Well, good morning from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I serve as the vicar here, and whether you're joining us uh, here in person on Park Avenue or joining us online at stbarts.org, it is my joy and delight to welcome you to the forum where each week we hold sacred conversations about the things that matter. And uh, this morning, it's the first Sunday of Advent, December 3rd here at St. Bart's. Uh, we are getting in the holiday spirit, and we're really... Uh, Honored to have with us Fiona Davis. Uh, she is the author of seven novels uh, that are historical fiction based in New York City. Uh, her latest book is The Spectacular, about uh, a Christmas tradition right in our backyard. Uh, the Radio City Music Hall Christmas Spectacular and the Rockettes are featured in this novel. And so we thought we'd have a little fun and get in the holiday spirit uh, and, and chat about the book. Fiona, thank you so much for uh, coming to St. Bart's this morning, and we're looking look forward to hearing more about the Rockettes and all the research you did that went into this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on this very cold, wet morning. I'm, I'm honored to be here and thrilled to talk a little bit about the book. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the inspiration and research behind the book. And then, of course, we can go open it up to, to questions about this book or any others or the Rockettes in general, which I've, I've learned a lot about. Um, so I write books that are set in New York City buildings, um, from Grand Central Terminal to the Dakota, to the Frick Collection, to the Chelsea Hotel. And what I do is I do a ton of research, and this helps that I was a journalist in my past life. And I do a lot of research, and then I, I look for the surprises. And in whatever building I'm researching, I look for the surprises, and then I use the facts as kind of a scaffolding and then layer a fictional story over it. And this one is a mix of fact and fiction, which is really fun to, to discuss. And I, I think my love of buildings came from uh, the fact that my parents are both English. And when I was a kid, we would go back to England every three years to visit all the relatives. And we'd drive all over from Scotland down to Portsmouth and all the way back up. And to keep my brother and myself from killing each other in the back seat of our rental car, we would stop every so often at castles or ruins or grand estates, and they'd let us run wild. And I loved it. I loved how old everything is in England, that, you know, there anything that's less than 400 years old is pretty recent. And I just loved imagining what it must have been like for a servant girl in the 1500s or an aristocrat in the 1800s. And so it's no surprise when I started writing historical fiction, I ended up setting each book in an iconic New York City building. And they've all come about in different ways. Um, the way I like to structure each book is usually there's a dual timeline where you're going back and forth in time, which is a wonderful way to contrast how the building, the residence, and the city has changed over time and how it hasn't. And what I do is I love uh, a murder or, or a mystery that really drives the story forward. So there's tension, and you're turning the pages. And then a couple really fun plot twists are always good. And as I said, each book came about a different way. And this book came about when, after I finished my last book, which was set at the Frick Collection, I got an email through my author website. And it was from a woman, and she said, my name is Sandy, I'm in my mid-80s, and I'm a former Rockette. And if you want to know all the secrets of Radio City Music Hall, you should call me. <laughs> and I thought, all right. And so that is how I met Sandy. And Sandy was a Rockette from 59 to 63. She started when she was 19. Um, she met her husband, Bob, there. He ran the lighting board. He was 19 as well. They've been married ever since. <laughs> and she had so many wonderful stories to share about what it was like to be a Rockette. And, and her memories were so vivid. And she, she talked all about how it was really just a, a, such an important moment in her life, being young and, and being here in New York City and dancing on that iconic stage. And she also had lots of programs and schedules and photographs um, and a lot of archival material. And she very kindly FedExed it to me so I could use it as my research. And, and I was just so honored to be able to, to go through that. And so that's where, and, and the, the wonderful thing about Sandy is on my very first book talk about this book, which was out in June, I, I did it in New Jersey. It was a big book launch and a, a wonderful space. And at the end, I was you know, out in the lobby signing books for everybody. 
And Sandy had come and she'd sat in the front row and answered some questions. She came with her husband and her son. And I looked over from where I was signing books and I noticed they'd set up a table for her and she was signing them too, <laughs> which I thought was wonderful. I wish I could take her everywhere I went. And so what I do with each book is I really dive into the research first. And so I wanted to learn as much about the Rockettes as I could. And I learned that they actually started in 1925 in St. Louis. They were known as the Missouri Rockets. And this man named Russell Markert decided to create a precision dance troupe. And he, he brought 16 girls together, and um, they became the, the Rockets. And they, they got a big fan base, and they came to New York, and they were asked to do a, a Broadway show. And there they caught the eye of a man named S.L. Rothafel, who's known as Roxy. And he was a theatrical empresario. He owned movie palaces all over America. And he thought the, the rockets were terrific. And so he took them under his wing, and he renamed them the Roxyettes. <laughs> and so they, they, they did a lot um, on Broadway, and they, they danced. And then on radio, Radio City was created, and on Radio City's opening night, they were part of the opening night show. And it was huge. It included the Flying Walendas. It included Martha Graham. Everyone came, Charlie Chaplin. Just everybody was there. There were over 6,000 people there. And it was a complete debacle. It was pouring rain. It went until 2.30 in the morning. And poor Roxy had to be taken out in a stretcher because he was so stressed. But Radio City opened. And at that point, it was a movie palace. It wasn't, like today it's a concert hall, right? And you see concerts there or comedians. Back then, it was a movie palace and they showed four movies a day. There were over 700 premieres at Radio City Music Hall from King Kong to Mame to White Christmas. And so it was very different from what it is today. And there were 46 girls who danced. At that point, they were renamed the Rockettes, finally. And you had 46 girls, there were 36 working at at any one time. And they would do all four shows, and the schedule was that you would do four shows a day for three or four weeks straight before you got a week off. So it was grueling. It was really, really tough. The pay was about $70 a week in the 1950s, which is when my book is set. And because each, each number that they did was tied to the movie that was showing, so say it was a John Wayne movie, they'd do a, a cowboy number. And so with each new premiere, they had to learn a completely new number. And they would learn that in between shows, before shows, late at night. And then on the premiere day, they'd have to be there at 5 a.m. They'd have a 7 a.m. dress rehearsal and then launch into the first show of the day, which was around 11 a.m. So it was really, really grueling. They did around 600 kicks per day. So you can imagine the core strength. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And, and so I, I you know, learned as much as I could about kind of the, what it was like back then, and then I, I wanted to know more about the theater. And of course, I'm sure a lot of people here have already been in it. It's really stunning. And that beautiful kind of orange, red, yellow hue actually was inspired by a sunset that Roxy saw during a transatlantic cruise. And that's where he decided to create a theater that resembled it and that's where Radio City came from. As I said, it's over 6,000 seats, and it's a, it's a really stunning place. Inside, the Art Deco design is by Donald Desky, and they brought in a lot of artists and sculptors to add to the murals and, and the, the, the inlay in that elevator um, to really make it special. It was really quite, quite a beautiful place. And it's different, right, from the Broadway theaters. Right? Because they were, they were built earlier, and this was built in the 1930s. And so in the book I describe, I wanted to kind of explain how it's different. And so I describe the Broadway theaters as hoop-skirted maidens from the last century, overly ornamented and full of froth, with flamboyant chandeliers and Rococo plasterwork. In contrast, Radio City resembled a jazz-age siren wearing a silk slip, sleek and elegant. And because there were so many people working there, you had not only the Rockettes, you had the Radio City Ballet Corps. You had a choral ensemble in between shows. If you bought a ticket to a movie, you could stay for the stage show. 
and you might see a juggler or a comedian. So it was this really wonderful, wonderful show. And, um, and, and because of that, on, I, on three sides of the theater, it's built up. There's seven stories of, of offices, of production offices, director's offices, rehearsal rooms. They had a 26-bed dormitory for when the girls stayed late and they wanted to stay over. They had a library, a lounge. They had a poster department. They had a shoe and hat department, a costume department, of course. Um, it was really, really incredible. And then up on the roof, they put shuffle ball courts and wiffle ball. So the girls would go up there in between shows and hang out, much to the delight of the workers in the office spaces above them. <laughs> and so it really was this, this little city, this community of people who, who worked and, and sometimes stayed over at the theater, which is really, really stunning. And for the research, um, oh, and this is the Roxy apartment, which is a beautiful space um, that Roxy had made. It's not really an apartment, there's no bedroom, but it's a space for entertaining. They had a dining room, this beautiful open area with cherry paneled walls and gold plated ceilings. And in the very corner there, there's a, a guest book that's signed by everybody from Judy Garland to Walt Disney of everyone who's passed by has signed that guest book. So it's a really special place. And Sandy was a great help in terms of, of doing research about what it was like to be a Rockette in the 1950s. And I spoke to a number of Rockettes who danced there in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And they all talked about just what an incredible experience it was that, you know, there they were, women, at a time when women were supposed to be secretaries or nurses or teachers or wives. There they were dancing on that stage, financially independent and able to make their own decisions. I remember asking one, what's your favorite memory of being a Rockette? And she said, my favorite memory is walking down Fifth Avenue in the middle of the night, arm in arm with my fellow Rockettes and singing at the top of our lungs. And there's just something for me that was so moving, that sense of freedom and sisterhood. Um, they all you know, worked under Russell Markert, who, who stayed on as the choreographer and the director until he retired in 1971. Keep in mind, he founded it in 1925. And Russell was a real father figure and really took care of them. Um, you know, If they had issues with their landlord or anything like that, he was there to really help them out. And I think that's why it was such a strong sisterhood. And, and why they all got along and, and really worked together well. I learned lots of fun things, because as an author, you don't want to describe a room for three pages, right? No one wants to read that. So I'm looking for small things that really anchor the reader in the story. And so I remember one Rockette telling me about how there was one conductor who on the last show of the night would speed up so he could catch his train at Grand Central. <laughs> and so they'd have to dance faster and faster and faster. And then one talked about, you know those toy soldiers uniforms that they wear, that, that iconic um, number that they do? In the 40s, those pants were so starched, you'd have to stand on a chair and climb into them. And again, those are those details that really help kind of make the story feel like it's anchored. And there were a lot of rules, of course. There were no tans or sunburns allowed. You couldn't gain weight. You had to keep your hair the same. And what I learned about it is so much of it is about illusions. And so, you know when they're doing the kick line, you know, it looks like they're all touching each other, but in fact, they're not. There is four or five inches of space in between the hand of the girl and the back of the girl next to her. They are not touching at all. And that's so that if one wobbles, it doesn't bring down the line. Um, but at the same time, you can imagine the strength to keep up that illusion and to be kicking your leg eye height. It's really pretty incredible. And then, of course, the illusion that they're all the same woman, you know, the same height, the same, very, very similar. What they do is they put the taller girls in the middle and the shorter girls on the end. Now, keep in mind, in, in 1925, the height requirement was 5'2 to 5'5 five, five and a half. Today, it's 5'5 five, five to 5'10 and a half. So you can see how we've, we've grown. And so what they do is they put the taller girls in the middle, the shorter ones at the end, and then all the hemlines were made to be the same. And that gives you the illusion that they're all the same, the same height. I also found this very odd article in the New York Times from 1967 about Miss Average Rockette talking about the topography 
of the average rockette, including you know, their wrist, their calf, their thigh, their shoe size, their height. It's a little creepy. Um, <laughs> But it really goes to show the obsession with the dancers and how throughout time, you know, when someone says they're a rockette, it makes you stand up and, and take notice because the, the audition and, and the way to get in is just so, so difficult. Today, it's one of the top paid um, salaries as a dancer here in New York City. You get a 401k plan, you get um, insurance, you get $10,000 that you can use to study further once you're done being a rockette. So they're, they're really well taken care of. And so in the past, in my book, it's a full-time job. That's what they did year round. Today, it is part-time. It's from November to January 1st, doing the Christmas Spectacular, which of course is going on now and, and, and just doing very, very well. One of the things I learned was that a lot of the Rockettes stayed at a place I'd never heard of. It was called the Rehearsal Hall. And this was a place on 53rd Street where women who were interested in a pursuing a career in the performing arts could stay. So you had to be taking an acting class, trying to find an agent, working on Broadway, singing opera, dancing. And it was two brownstones um, size on 53rd Street. And a number of women stayed there. If you saw the movie Stage Door, that's inspired by and based on the rehearsal hall, the rehearsal club. And there were rules. You had to be between 18 and 25, neither married nor divorced. You couldn't smoke, you couldn't drink, you couldn't have boys above the parlor level, um, although I'm sure they snuck them up. Um, and you got two meals a day, plus room and board, for $18 a week in the 50s, which is not bad. Some of the people who stayed there included Carol Burnett, Sandy Duncan, um, Blythe Danner. So it was really a wonderful place. If you Google, Carol Burnett and the Rehearsal Club, you will see a picture of her jumping on a bed. And it, you can imagine what a great roommate she would have made. I think <laughs> it would have been so much fun. And so that was the Rehearsal Club. And my main character is a character named Marion. And she's 19 years old, and she, she very much wants to be a Rockette, and her father is against it. And that's inspired by a number of Rockettes I spoke to who danced in the 40s, 50s, 60s, who said their families were dead set against it. That was not what a good girl did. Um, and as opposed to today, right, when, when someone says that you know, their daughter is a Rockette, you are in awe. So it was very different then. And so Marion is actually inspired by a, an, a dancer named Vera Ellen. She was in um, White Christmas very famous, but she started out as a Rockette. She was one of the youngest ones, I think she was 16. And she came to be a Rockette, but she couldn't fit in, right? This is a precision dance troupe. You need technique and discipline and strength. And when you are told to do a kick that is shoulder high, it has to be shoulder high. And her kicks would be eye height, you know? Or, or her arms would be more than, she was just more than anything. You couldn't contain her. She was bigger than life, and she couldn't pull it back to be part of this precision dance troupe. And so Russell Markert gave her a couple weeks to figure it out, and she quit before she got fired and went on to a great career. But it really made me think about kind of the theme that, that kind of travels throughout the book, and that is what is the cost of suppressing your own creativity or your own individuality for the good of the whole, right? When do you work together as a community, as a church, as a dance troupe, and when do you have to kind of pull back and, and stop and make your voice heard and stand out from the crowd? And so that's a theme that's lightly scattered throughout the book and very much inspired by the story of Vera Ellen. And so in all of my books, I like to have a hook that anchors the book in New York City. So we're not only talking about the building, we're also talking about what's going on in the city at that time. And in my research, I googled what happened in New York City in the 1950s. And I got, okay, so-and-so won you know, the, the, the pennant and this kind of thing. And I also read that in 1956, it said, the police were ramping up their hunt for the mad bomber. I had never heard of him. And it turns out this guy had been setting bombs for 16 years. He set 33 bombs. He injured 15 people, some seriously. And he would set them in iconic New York City buildings like Penn Station, Grand Central, the New York Public Library. He set two at Radio City Music Hall. 
And the minute I read that, I thought, that's amazing. Again, it's a surprise that is, for me, if it's a surprise to me, it's probably a surprise to the reader. Maybe that should go into the story. And when I learned that he did set two at Radio City Music Hall, it seemed to say, OK, let's explore this further. And so I learned all I could about this guy. And what was interesting is he was caught by using criminal profiling for the very first time. There was this psychiatrist at Elmhurst State Hospital in Queens named James Brussel. And the police came to him because they were at wit's end. They could not figure out who this guy was. And they brought all of the letters and notes that he'd sent over the years. And he spent some time studying them. And he looked at them and he said, OK, here's your guy. He's 40 to 50 years old. They said he's Roman Catholic from Eastern Europe. He's not married. He lives with an older female relative. They said he's very methodical, very well dressed. When you find him, he said, he'll be wearing a double-breasted suit, and it will be buttoned. And without giving anything away, the science of cr criminal profiling was born. And, this, and they caught him. And, and James Brussel went on to go ahead and, and you know, talk to police all over the country to share the, as to how he did it and what he did. And, and it was really incredible. And so in my book, I call him the Big Apple Bomber. There's a few things that are changed, but I make it very clear in the author's note what's fact, what's fiction. With this, most is fact. And so in my story, we have Marion, who's this 19-year-old um, dancer dancing at Radio City Music Hall. And after a very personal tragedy, she becomes involved in the hunt for the Mad Bomber. And that puts her in line with a, a psychiatrist I call Peter, who's both brilliant and introverted, unlike she is. And together, they have to team up and try and figure out who this guy is. And so it's a mix of a thriller, it's historical fiction, it's a mystery, but it's got all that backstage glamour of Radio City Music Hall in the 1950s, which is so much fun to write about. And it has all the themes in all of my books, and that's how women's voices and agency have changed over time and how they haven't. The, the importance of the arts in our lives, and then just finding these hidden stories that are tucked beneath New York's historic timeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. And we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you're here in the room, Suzanne Vorster has question cards. Uh, just raise your hand. She'll come around to you. Uh, fill out the question cards. She'll bring them up to me. If you're joining us online, you can type your questions into the live chat on YouTube, the comments on Facebook, or you can email me, pthompson at stbarts.org. If you're in the room, email works as well. Wow. Um, we, so many you, ways you to ask so questions. You are so connected. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fiona, while we're waiting for those to come in, um, I this is the first of your books that I read. I. Uh, it's the, the amount of research you've done really comes through in the text. So many details. And I wonder if you can talk a little more about your research process. And I, I know that you personally don't have any background in dance. So what was it like to, to learn about um, this, this troupe of dancers, uh, given that you've never been a dancer yourself? It was terrifying. I mean, the thought of, of, you know, dance is such a precise art, and, and, you know, you can either do it or you can't, and I'm not flexible, you know, I, there's just no way. Um, but what I found was talking to Rockettes, that dancers are really great at explaining what it's like. And I think that's because when they learn choreography, they, they're told kind of how to move. And so they're able to take in words, and so they're able to explain to me what it's like to be a dancer. One talked about, um, a dancer who'd been in the San Francisco Ballet is very tall. And she talked about what it was like to be in the Corps de Ballet and pull back everything, you know, not lift her leg as, as far as it should go so that it matched everybody else. And the way she explained it, I remember, you know, I was interviewing her and, and writing it out on my computer. And as she spoke, I thought, that is going right into the book. <laughs> you know, I don't have to change a word. It's just so precise and, and beautiful. And so for my research, you know, I was a journalist, so. I'm not afraid of just reaching out and asking dumb questions. And I like to find experts who know everything about what I'm, ta what I'm interested in. And there's one wonderful architectural historian who lives here in New York City named Andrew Alpern. And he's in his 80s. He has lived in New York his entire life. And he has a photographic memory of every street over time. 
He's incredible. He's written a wonderful book about the Dakota called The Greatest Apartment House in the World. It's a great coffee table book, great gift if you have friends who love, love New York City. And so what I do is I meet him for lunch, and I say, all right, here's a building, talk to me. And he'll give me some wonderful tips, like for example, the building that's set at the New York Public Library. Um, for that one, you know, I learned that when it was built, they included a seven-room apartment deep inside for the superintendent and his family to live in. And he lived there with his wife and three children. His daughter was born in the library. Um, and then Andrew mentioned about this wonderful book that, not wonderful, this <laughs> terrible book that, it's wonderful for me, um, that happened in 1993 at Columbia University, where a thief stole $1.8 million of rare books over the course of three months, and no one could figure out how he was getting in and out of the building. And so I took that theft, transposed it to my story about the New York Public Library, and I was off to the races. Mm. So that's the kind of thing I do, is just finding out what really happened and then seeing how I might be able to fit it into my story. And it's amazing when we get to the bomber that he was kind of creating terror in New York for 16 years, and very few people are aware that this happened within the last century. It's so true. In fact, when I do talks, um, you know, a lot of them around here in New York, people who are longtime New Yorkers are saying, yeah, I, I either forgot about that or I hadn't thought about it in years. One woman in a, a book talk said, yeah, I was in Queens at that time. And when we went to the movies, you would check your seat to make sure there wasn't a slit in it because that's what he would do. He would slide a pipe bomb under the seat inside the upholstery. And that was just so visceral to hear that. So we have plenty of questions already. Um, one person wonders about the name Radio City Music Hall. Um, do you know why it would be called Music Hall if it primarily functioned for a while as a movie theater? Yeah, you know, it was meant to be a theater theater. And it just didn't work. The first few years they were struggling and they couldn't make it work financially. And that's why they changed it to a, a mm -hmm. picture hall, I guess they would have called it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit of a, a, an issue. And it was a, during the Great Depression, of course, so things weren't easy as they thought it might be. Mm. Great question. Another person wonders about the connection with the, uh, another huge theater, the Roxy on 7th Avenue. Yes, and that, that I believe was one of Roxy's theaters. And, and I believe there were a couple mm -hmm. bombs set there as well, maybe one or two. Um, so that was targeted as well. So yeah, they were kind of sister, because they were under his aegis, yeah. Mm. yeah. Can you talk a little more about the training Rockettes would have to undergo? Oh boy, you know, you have to be proficient in tap, dance, and ballet. And the audition is a three day long process. Um, there are hundreds of women lined out outside Radio City, and they're brought in in batches of 100 to dance in the rehearsal hall, and they're given a number, you know, a, a, like 16 count number, and they have to do it, and then some are eliminated, and they do it again, and they do it for tap, jazz, and ballet. And then they also have to stand, the first thing they do is stand in a height measurement against the wall to make sure they are actually as tall as they say they are. Um, and then the ones and who some don't get fit in, out, yep, right? they get yeah. kicked out right away. And, and so it's really, really tough. And they make it tough because the actual, you know, being a Rockette is so tough. Here in, in New York, they're doing between two and five shows a day. And so it's just that tough. And then they bring them back the next day, a smaller group, and see how much they remember, how much they can retain, and then finally choose the ones who are chosen. And if you're a Rockette, you have to re audition every year. It's not easy. <laughs> and that's still true. That that's you have still to true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so most of these dancers have years of experience going into these auditions. Yes, yes. yeah. They, they've been dancing, uh, you know, for most of their lives. Mm. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the political context of the 50s and how that influenced your narrative? For sure. You know, you know, as a woman in the 50s, you could not, you know, open a checking account or get a credit card without a man's signature. Um, and when you think about, you know, that was until the 70s was when that changed, which is incredible to mm -hmm. think. And so, you know, politically at that time, things were very much about women staying in their place. In my story, the father, in order to, if, there, if his daughter, the father is very kind of, he, he likes to dictate and very controlling. And so when either of his daughters misbehaves, his punishment is to take away their pearls. 
And I'd read that. Someone had, had talked about that, that that's what their dad did to punish them. And is it, it's just so typical 50s, isn't it, you know, of, of okay, that's, he'd take them and lock them away. Right. And, and so I wanted to definitely infuse that in the book because I think a lot of people, especially younger people today, don't understand how far we've come and how hard it's been um, for women to be able to do what they want to do. And so for, for sure, that factors in the book. Mm. Marianne's kind of a feminist heroine in a way um, because she defies her father and, and does what she feels called to do. Um, I, I wonder, did you wrestle with um, the fact that these women are empowered because they have a starring role, but they're also objectified in a way? That's true. And, you know, a number of Rockettes mentioned that being a Rockette in the 50s, you were preyed on. Um, you know, by any, the, the men who come to see the show, the, the, you know, people, the crew sometimes, you had to be really, really careful. And so, yeah, Marion is, is one who wants to, you know, do her own thing, but at a great cost, mm. at a huge cost. And, and so what is the price of going against your father's wishes, you know, to do what you feel like you were born to do? What, what's going to happen to you? And that's what I wanted to explore in the book. I'm also wondering if you wrestled with race at all. Um, the Rockettes did not include a black dancer until the late 80s. Um, yep. That would have been less unusual in the 50s, but I know you were thinking a lot about gender. Was, was, did race come into your research too? Absolutely. You know, there, there were no, they, their whole thing was, well, we don't want the line to look, anyone to look different. So we can't possibly have a black dancer. And that lasted, as you said, in, until the 80s, which is pretty late. And now they have um, rockets with disabilities. They have, you know, rockets of, of, that are, it's more diverse. And, you know, it, for me, setting a book in the 50s, you know, I didn't want to try and, and include someone who, who wouldn't have been there anyway. But in all my books, I want to address it. And so, for example, my book set at the Frick Collection, which is just up the street. Um, you know, that is an art collection collected by a, a, a white man, a very wealthy white man. And the, the diversity on the, on the walls of the Frick is, it was very much lacking in that time. And so part of that book for me I set in the 1960s, and I included a black intern named Joshua, who is to team up with a, uh, a fashion model who does a Vogue shoot at the Frick collection in the 60s that goes terribly wrong. She's a terrible model. And she gets stuck inside during a three-day snowstorm, along with a, this intern named Joshua. And she stumbles upon a series of, of um, kind of uh, poems and, and clues hidden behind the artwork of the Frick. And she, it's kind of a scavenger hunt that she has to do to try and solve a, 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 a murder that happened in the Frick family many years ago. And so she teams up with this black intern named Joshua. And through him, he's very interested in outsider art. And so through him, we can have a voice of what is missing from the Frick's walls. And these days, again, they're, they're very much concerned about diversity and doing what they can to address that situation. But I wanted to include that as a way to have a discussion about how things have changed and, again, how they haven't. I know that you saw this this year's spectacular yesterday. I wonder how you watch the spectacular differently now that you've, you have all this historical knowledge? It's, it's really fun. I, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting to watch them do their kick line when you know that they're not touching, because you can see it. You can see their hands are moving independently, you know, in a way that wouldn't normally look like that. And so, yeah, I, I, I find it just wonderful. And, you know, there's something about people doing something in synchronicity that just causes this well of emotion. I don't know what it is, but when they form that first kick line at the spectacular, I, you, you're, you're, I, you know, your tears start forming in your eyes for some reason. Um, and so it's just a magical show. And you know, it's changed over the years. Now they have drone snowflakes that fly <laughs> around at one number. Um, and so it's a little different. And there's a 3D aspect to the show as well a couple times. But it, it's just wonderful, and you know, having a huge sold-out audience in that beautiful space, watching them dance, is still just as magical to me as it was the first time I saw it. Since we're in a church right now, I wonder if you can reflect on the end of the spectacular, which has survived these nine decades. It ends in a religious way. 
uh, any thoughts on 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 the how the the true meaning of Christmas has sort of stayed in there all this time? Yeah, you know that is one of the numbers, and there's a few of them that have stayed on the entire time from the very beginning of doing the spectacular. And the the manger number with the three kings and the camel. There's still two camels, a few sheep, a goat, and they're still marching on stage. Um, they're, they're kept in stalls down in the basement, and they're walked at like 5.30 a.m. It's just amazing. And, and there's something really magical about that scene as, you know, you have all of the, the, the magi, you know, everybody f at, the, at the foot of the, the manger looking up. That's really, really just so moving. And, and for me in the book, there's a major scene set during that number <laughs> where everything falls apart. <laughs> um, and it was, you know, and the, a camel sneezes in someone's face. It was really fun to explore it from a kind of a backstage perspective, if you will. Uh, someone wonders what the average uh, length of time a dancer stays in the Rockettes, um, what that was historically, and now if, if you know if it's changed. Yeah, you know, in the past, they did tend to cycle out pretty quickly because you'd go on and get married and have, have children, so it might be two, three, four years. There was apparently one Rockette who was there from the 30s to the 60s. Yeah, I learned that yesterday. Mm. So you're always learning something new. Um, and these days, you know, you can stay as long as you want. There's dancers who've been there 14, 15, 16 years. Um, a, a, a dancer who I interviewed and was very helpful, Rhonda Melkin, who she teaches a dance fusion class for students who want to be a Rockette. And in fact, 60 of her students have become Rockettes. Um, she's very, she did it for 13, 13 or 14 years. So, you know, you can, you can keep on doing it. And again, these, these days it is part time. So it's a little different. Mm. And one of the concerns of Marion's father is that she's only going to do this for a few years and there's not security, et cetera. Yeah, a lot of yeah. the Rockettes I spoke to who were in the 40s, 50s, 60s did leave, you know, after three, four, five years. Mm. So it was a, a shorter time period. Can you talk a little more about the, you do get a sense of this in the book, the community that forms between the different Rockettes. How did they kind of help one another and develop friendships as well as working relationships. Yeah, you know, when I would interview them, I'd say, okay, give me the dirt. What really went on? Like, was there any backstage, you know, shenanigans? And they all said no. They all said everyone was so delighted to be there that it was really this wonderful sisterhood. And in fact, there's a very strong alumni network um, still today. And so there's still, and I think there's a 100th anniversary coming up uh, soon. And so, you know, they're still going strong, which is wonderful. Hmm. Someone wonders uh, what's, on your, what's next on your list in terms of New York City landmarks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you announced your next project already, uh, but can you talk about uh, where you're looking next? You've done the library, you've done the Frick, you've done Radio City Music Hall, what's next? Yeah, you know, I, I like to say there's so many buildings in New York, I'll be doing the gas station on the corner of 11th Avenue, you know, <laughs> but I'll make it work. Um, <laughs> but I'm not there yet. Um, so I, I, the next building is set at the Met Museum which is, of course, an incredible place. Um, I was a little daunted at choosing it because there's so much to see there. Um, and so it's from the point of view of an associate curator at the Met who, um, it partly takes place in Egypt, actually, in the 1930s. That required a trip for me to Egypt in April, right, for research. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. And so it's partly set in the 30s, partly in the 1970s. So 1978 is the main timeline. And that's from the point of view of a 60-something associate curator in the Egyptian wing. And she has to team up with an assistant for the Met Gala, so two very different arms of the museum, in order to solve uh, something that goes missing. And so I like to say it's glamour and mummies, and we'll see how it goes. It's, it's really fun to work on. I, we were just talking about that. <laughs> I got a hard sell already, trust yeah. me. Yeah, there's a lot of history yeah. here. And there really is. I love that it's on the location of a former brewery, right? That's just, you could do a lot with that. <laughs> Um, there is an interesting c connection I discovered because, of course, as you read historical fiction or watch something on Netflix, you are Googling yourself the whole time. Yes. And um, the rehearsal club was founded by the daughter of the Bishop of New York at the time, Bishop Greer, who was the rector of St. Bart's before he became Bishop of New York. So we have a, we have a connection to all of this. That is Not wonderful. Not only is it our backyard, yeah. I love that. You know, you think New York's this huge city, but in fact, there's all these connections 
cases. And, and in my research, I'm always coming up on something like that. I love that. Um, so we, we still have a few minutes. If there are any more questions, Suzanne will come around with question cards. You can email them in. Um, you, I know, Fiona, you were diagnosed with Parkinson's in a, a few years ago, I yeah. think. And Parkinson's makes its way into the book, and you talk about your own diagnosis in the note at the end. Yeah. And I wonder if you can reflect on why it's been so important for you to be open about your diagnosis, and to so much so that it becomes a part of your book. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so in 2020, I had a very strange year, where I, one day in August, I got a call from my editor and my agent, and they said, we have great news. Your, your latest book hit the New York Times bestseller list. And I thought, oh, fantastic, top of the world. The next day, I went to a neurologist because my hand had been shaking as I held my phone. And he said, oh, you have Parkinson's. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, we're really you know, going on a ride here. And, but I did what I do. I researched, right? I wanted to know what, what's going to happen to me. And I learned that I'm very early stages. My symptoms are really minor. They're completely controlled by medication. So uh, you know, it's very early days. And then I got to know people at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, of course, and you know, met people who've had it for 20 years who are really um, thriving. And that kind of put my mind at ease. But as I'm writing this book, I'm thinking, you know, what you do is you pick a character, and you have her have a goal, and then you put obstacles in her way, right? That's a book. You don't write a book about a happy family who gets happier. No one wants to read that. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, OK, I have this dancer. Now, what is the worst thing that can happen to a dancer? And I thought, you lose control of your body. And I thought, well, I have all this information. And so it's, it's sprinkled very lightly through the book. It's not the main part. Um, but I wanted to see if I could explore it in some way, and also just to talk openly about it, because I know so many people who have Parkinson's, and they don't tell anyone, because they either don't want to seem old, or they don't want to lose their job, which is absolutely valid. Um, but it is the second most common neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease in America after Alzheimer's. And there's so many people who have it. it. More people are getting it every year. And I felt like it's almost like breast cancer 30 years ago, right, where no one spoke about it. And today, of course, breast cancer, there's you know, a huge political force, and there's changes, and, and there's been so much progress. And so just having have it, I wanted to be open about it. And at every book signing I do, someone comes up to me and mentions, yep, my mother had it, I have it. And so just a way of letting people know that if they do have it, they're not alone. There's lots of resources, and there's lots of hope. The, the Michael J. Fox, you know, the, the pipeline for um, new medications and possibly cures and treatments is just, it's very exciting. If you're going to get it, now's the time. <laughs> so I'm doing fine, but thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, it was a powerful inclusion, and I think the visibility is so, so important. Yeah. Um, you, the narrative switches a little bit between the 50s and the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, it begins with the dancer looking back, with Marion looking back. And I wonder if you can talk about why you decided uh, just as with your upcoming book, you're in kind of two periods. Why having the, the 90s as part of the narrative was important, too? Yeah, you know, when I first decided to try writing historical fiction, and I didn't do that until I was in my late 40s, I had this story idea, and I loved dual timeline books, and I thought, oh, I'll do that. And that became my first book, The Dollhouse at the Barbizon Hotel for Women. And, you know, if I'd known how hard it is to write a dual timeline novel, where you have an element of mystery, so you can't give out one clue in one timeline or you'll screw it up in the other. If I'd known how hard it is, I would have never done it. But then I became known for it, and so my publisher is like, there's going to be a dual timeline, right? <laughs> and a building. Um, and, so, and so with each book, I kind of play around with it. Sometimes they're very important, going back and forth. With this one, there's maybe four or five chapters, as Marion is an older woman, reflecting back and kind of going through a, a, an arc of her own at the, at the end of the book, um, which I hope is moving and, and you know, kind of gives closure to what's a, a, a fairly harrowing story. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it, and it's fun to have a character looking back because I, I just love to write about older women who just take no prisoners, you know, who are, who are tough and say what they think. And so there's usually one in every book. <laughs> you know, m the most fun was writing about Helen Frick, who was uh, the daughter of Henry Clay Frick, who was this tough woman 
who did what she wanted when she wanted, and she was very wealthy, so that was easy. But at the same time, she led a, a pretty difficult life and, and you know, had issues of her own. And so just writing from the perspective of a woman in her 80s who just you know, says it like it is, I find really freeing. So dual timelines work well for that. All right, I'll try to fit two or three more questions in. Um, uh, someone wonders if the rockets were ever in danger of being eliminated, and I know that plays a part in, in the book. Yeah, you yeah. know, um, they, were, they were always, you know, it, part of Radio City, but Radio City Music Hall itself was in great danger at one point. In the 70s, they were going to demolish it. It was going to be torn down, and um, they kind of all came together to, to fight for it, and so that's why it's as beautiful as it is now. There was a huge renovation done after, and so everything was kept the same, the carpets, the, the, you know, the seats, everything was kept the same because those protections were in place. Can you talk about your novella about bootlegging in the East End? Yes, oh, that's great. Who asked that? <laughs> I love that. So um, my boyfriend is a writer as well. He writes a thriller, a mystery. And I had a minor foot operation last year, and I said, you know, we should, a friend of ours had just published an audiobook novella. And we thought, oh, that could be fun, right? Let's do something together and do that. And, and so, you know, we came up with this great idea, and it's uh, from the point of view of a woman who runs a criminal empire from the Plaza Hotel during Prohibition. Um, it's from the point of view of the, the getaway driver, a, a young woman who's her getaway driver, and then the point of view of a detective who's trying to bring them down. And so it's a triangle of who's kind of double-crossing who. And, um, and um, it came from a story that we, we uh, heard about in, that happened out on the east end of, 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 the, of Long Island, where um, a, a mayor in the 30s was at a speakeasy there, and it got raided. And so he, he put on a waiter's apron and just walked out with the staff. And we thought, you know, no one ever notices the help. And so that became a part of the book. And it's called The Gimlet Slip. It, it'll be out in, on March 5th as audiobook, and then six months later, it'll be an ebook. And it was really fun to write. It was really fun to work on. Uh, so, as a final question, as a final question, um, talk about New York City. Um, you've now written seven books, and the, the eighth is going to be coming out about this city. You didn't grow up here, but mm -hmm. you've lived here, I think, your whole adult life, yeah. um, or most of it. Um, how has your understanding of the city changed, and what, what is New York City for you? That's a great question. Yeah, you know, I've been here for 37 years now, and, you know, researching these books just gives me such a different way to look at buildings. You know, for example, when I go into Grand Central Terminal, I always look for that black spot up in the ceiling on the northwest corner where they didn't clean it to show what it was like after years of cigar and cigarette smoke. Um, and so there's this little black rectangle on the, on the northwest corner. And you look at that and you think, imagine the entire ceiling blackened like that. And so for me, as I'm walking around, I'm just constantly seeing the stories that have happened in the past and wanting to bring them to life. And it's so wonderful for me to hear from readers who are from New York City or visiting and saying that, you know, they came to appreciate the library or, or Grand Central or the Frick or the Barbizon Hotel for Women in a different way, and to be able to look at things as not only as they are now, but as they were, and remember the people who came through those buildings and everything they did to really help shape the city. So I'm so appreciative of being here, absolutely. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Fiona Davis, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The latest book is The Spectacular. It's available in our bookstore, so uh, pick up a copy on your way out, uh, and you might even be able to convince Fiona to sign one for you. Uh, next week at the forum, we'll be uh, joined by Bishop Rob Hirschfeld, who is the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire. Uh, he's written a book about having depression for several decades and how his uh, faith has comforted him through that and, and how uh, his own experiences can uh, inform the mental health crisis uh, that we are in today. So please join us for that. Please also stick around for worship if you'd like at 11 a.m. Um, either here or online. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.